If you have your copy of God's Word, you can go ahead and find Acts chapter 3. And as you turn there, I want to ask the question, why did the church father, Augustine, say, we are restless until we find our rest in thee? Why did he say that about the human heart, that we are restless until we find our rest in the living God? Wasn't well, that the human experience that we, we kind of all enter the world with this longing, and over time, as you grow, you, you have this appetite, this longing for eternity, as Solomon would say in Ecclesiastes 3.11, that can't be satisfied by anything this world has to offer. Perhaps it's why the famous actor and comedian Jim Carrey was once noted as saying, I think that everybody should get rich and famous. He says, I think that everybody should get rich and famous and do everything that they ever dreamed of just so they can see that that's not the answer. What do you think whenever you hear that? You think that's a little dramatic. Or do you think, you know what, I, I agree. That's been my own personal experience. Maybe you would say, you know what, I don't know if he's right or wrong, but I would at least love the opportunity to find out for myself. Rich, famous, everything I ever dreamed of. Now we know this is the human condition. We have this longing, this ache within our soul for something greater. And here's what's dangerous about that. Often we seek to, we seek to fill that void, to curb that appetite with things that could never satisfy. That often leads us deeper into brokenness, and Scripture calls that brokenness sin. You see, our sinful tendencies to seek in the world what only God can give often only increases our longing and adds to our personal pain. Do you know that? Do you feel that? Have you experienced that? We become the kind of people that just expect too much of those around us, or we start to view other people that are made in the image of God as objects to get what we want or obstacles in our own way. Oh, we become dependent dependent on entertainment, dependent upon interests or distractions, dependent upon other forms of escape that at the end of the day will only leave us feeling ashamed or unfulfilled. And, and worst of all, this sin, whatever collateral damage it causes, worst of all, this sin has separated us from the God that we were created to know and to glorify. We find ourselves empty, broken, and the world has nothing, try as it may, to soothe our pain. And isn't this the human condition? The human condition is, is this relentless pursuit of wholeness and healing in a world that just can't provide. In Acts 3, we see a man, a man who is somewhat of a picture of us all. He's broken. He's a man who's crippled. He's a man who is a living embodiment of the fall, that sin has cursed everything in the world, and he is in need of healing. And in search of some sort of relief, he's carried daily to the temple, sitting outside of its gates, begging for some spare change just to find some relief. And whatever he receives always leaves him feeling unsatisfied. But what we find in Acts 3 is that one moment one conversation, one interaction, one exposure to the power of Christ will change everything in this man's life. And this is good news for you. Because for those of you who don't know Christ, who perhaps feel that present longing, searching for satisfaction, could it be that Acts 3 will reveal the glory of Christ and show you a better way? For those of you who already have a relationship with Christ, could it be that as we rehearse this story of grace in this man's life that you would see your own story and be filled with inexpressible joy at the kindness of Christ and the mercy he offers? As a church, I want us to be so in awe of the grace of God toward us that serving others, loving our neighbor, and going to the end of the earth is not a duty to endure, but a delight to obey. It's my prayer that as we see how Christ has raised us up to walk with him, that we would run to the glory of God. And so what is our only hope as we find ourselves 
longing to feel whole. It is this, that we are healed and made whole when we are raised to walk with Jesus. We are healed and made whole when we are raised to walk with Jesus. Now, before we look at the specific verses that we will read today, I want to give you a little overflow of uh, where we've been so far, right? Because everything that's going to happen now is just going to flow over from what we've seen in this book so far. In Acts 1, the Holy Spirit was promised. In Acts 2, the Holy Spirit comes on the day of Pentecost. He descends and he indwells the people of God. And in Acts chapter 3, we see the Holy Spirit enabling the work of God. Now, as Jimmy preached so well last week in Acts 2, we see this general summary statement at the end of Acts 2. But there is this phrase in Acts 2.43 where it says that all came upon every soul as signs and wonders were done by the hands of the apostles. What were those signs and wonders? Give us a, a specific example of the kinds of miracles that were happening in the early church. In Acts 3, verses 1 through 10, we'll do just that. So if you have your copy of God's word, you can look with me at verse 1. It says this. Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a man lame from birth was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, that is called the beautiful gate, to ask alms of those entering the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms. And Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God and recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple asking for alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Isn't it amazing what can happen in 10 verses of scripture? This man goes from being broken and lying in the dirt to raised and praising God. And so what I hope to do during our time together is just show you the progression from brokenness to praise, to see how that plays out in the life of every single person that calls upon the name of the Lord and can play out in every single person's life who calls upon the name of the Lord. We'll look at four postures that both characterize this man and the life of the Christian who is raised to walk in the newness of life with Jesus. First, we find ourselves sitting in our broken state. That's where this man is right here. At the beginning of chapter 3, this man is sitting in his broken state. Luke, our author, Dr. Luke, moves from a general summary, as before, into a specific scene. And the scene begins with Peter and John, two well-known characters throughout the ministry of Jesus and up to this point in the book of Acts. And they're walking at 3 o'clock in the day toward the temple. Well, they wouldn't have been the only people to do that. This was one of the hours of prayer. In the Jewish schedule, there were three times of prayer. And this third time, uh, called the Tamid, is one of the most significant because it was one of the prayer times in which they would make one of the two sacrifices that happened each and every day. And there was typically a pretty big crowd that would attend this time of prayer because typically at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, the ninth hour according to the Jewish schedule, most people were finished with their daily tasks. If you couldn't make the first two, well, you could at least make this one. And so everybody is walking toward the temple, including Peter and John. Uh, Peter and John would continue to go to the temple, at least for the meantime, because they viewed their Christianity as a fulfillment of the promises of Judaism. And so they're going to worship. Now, I, I want you to see a few things uh, about just them walking toward the temple. They have no idea that God is about to do something miraculous, right? It is in the midst of the mundane and ordinary that they are about to experience the power of God. Now, isn't that amazing? And so I just want to challenge you for a moment to be open to interruption whenever it comes to what God could be doing in your life at any present moment. 
right? Parent, have you ever been driving and you're headed to the grocery store and, you know, you've, you're minding your own business or thinking about whatever, you know, and then and your kid just from the backseat hurls a deep theological question. And you're like, oh, I think God might be doing something here. Or, or you're, you know, you're trying to get your trash cans in from the driveway before your dinner gets cold, and then your neighbor says, hey, you have a minute to talk? And begin to, I mean, this was last Thursday for me, right? Hey, I don't know why. I'm struggling with some stuff right now. You're just like, okay, is God doing something here, right? Whenever, whenever your coworker asks, like, what'd you do this weekend? And you can say, not much. Or you can say, you know what? Yesterday, I, I went to church and we heard this story about the way that God changes lives. Could, could God be doing something with that? If, if you're saying, Lord, my schedule is yours. Interrupt me at any moment, right? Because Peter and John, they're like, hey, we, I mean, we got to get the good seats. You know, we need to get in there. And then it's like, wait, hold on. We've passed by this guy before, but I think this is, this is different today. And also notice that it's Peter and John, right? I love this. I mean, could these guys have been more different? You know what I mean? Peter is loud and outspoken, right? Uh, John is the disciple that Jesus loved. Now, granted, he gave himself that title, so, but, you know, he's also writing inspired scripture, so it's got to be right. Peter is the one who betrays Jesus. You know, John's the one who Jesus is hanging on the cross, and he says, John, treat, treat my mom like your mom now, right? And because God has brought reconciliation, there's no, com- there's no competitive nature. These guys are a team, this is part of the kindness of Christ, even in Luke 10, 1, to send out his people in pairs. Let me ask, as we see Peter and John here, who comes after your and? Who's part of your team in this journey of Christian ministry? Man, I think about my wife and, and the gift that she has been. If you're married, you know what that's like, right? I mean, I think about Jimmy, you know? I mean, we've been doing this together for so long. I think about our elders, and, and how the Lord has been so kind to provide for our church. I think about our staff. I think about each of you. Man, I think about whenever I met Caden unloading a food truck in the middle of COVID. And I'm like, who is this guy? And now he's like one of our best friends. Who is your and? Who's part of your group? Who are those that are walking alongside you? Because God in his kindness has made us better together. And and I want you to know, if you're here and you're like, I I don't really know the answer to that question, I want you to know there are people in this room right now who want to be that for you, because that is how God has designed the Christian life to be lived out. And so here we see Peter and John, they're together, They're, they're walking alongside one another, whenever simultaneously there is this man who's being carried, this man who had never walked a day in his life. We're we're told here by the scriptures that this man has been lame from birth. And as someone who is completely dependent upon the generosity of others, being at the temple during the third time of prayer would be exactly where you want to be. Well, why is that? First off, it would have been really well attended. Not only that, we know from rabbinic literature that the three pillars of Jewish faith were the Torah, all right, so the first five books of the Bible, worship, and the giving of alms, or giving charitably to those who had need. And so if you're someone who lives off the generosity of others, and you are a part of Jewish life, that is exactly where you want to be in order to be able to make enough money just to afford your next meal. And I think as we consider this man's life, that daily he would have sat outside of those gates, this beautiful gate, and cried out, alms for the poor that this is such a difficult existence. For many, of us, for many of us, it's hard to relate. For some of you, maybe you can relate. Maybe, maybe you've got uh, some sort of physical ailment that is just chronic, that hurts. But as we look at this man's life, I, I want us just to consider the plight, the difficult hand that it seems he has been dealt. I mean, how would his situation put a strain on many of the people that he loved dearly around him? I mean, if you think about it, he would have been completely dependent economically on, on everything that he had, right? That's why, that's why he's just trying to get spare change from people. He's like, I don't want to burden my, my parents, my, my brothers, my sisters. I want to at least do something that, that I can provide for myself a little bit. I just want to survive one more day. I just want to, 
I want to be able to afford one more meal. Imagine what this would do to a person's dignity if every single thing that you had was because somebody else had given it to you. I mean, I mean how would you feel? Think about just his, his mental and emotional state. This guy was isolated, right? Do you think anybody's just going to say, you know what, like, I'm just going to sit next to you for a few hours in the dirt. Nobody was going to do that with him. I mean, we, we don't know how, how this guy is actually feeling. I mean, Scripture doesn't tell us that, but we can kind of use some context clues to imagine this would be very difficult. Not only that, we know that he's physically confined. I mean, not only do we know that wheelchairs just didn't exist at this point, right? So that there's no way for him to be somewhat mobile on his own. His entire existence is dependent upon wherever the last person carried him. And so right now we find him carried to the temple. It's hard for us to fully imagine maybe, maybe what this feels like. And so there was a, a female poet who had a, a debilitating disease in the mid-1800s. And she reflects on her own situation in a way that perhaps adds some color of understanding to how he would have felt. She says, the world just goes on without me while I lie here hour after hour, day after day, feeling the same weakness, which no care or medicine can remedy. My body has failed me, but my mind, it still yearns for engagement with life. It's as if I observe the world from a distance. It's like I'm just a spectator. I'm no longer an actor in the play. He would have felt like a stranger in his own skin while everybody else is out living their life. He would have never known the joy of, of what it means for a parent to look at him as a young child when he takes his first few steps and just erupt in excitement and in joy. He would have never felt that rush as a child that you get when unexpectedly a friend runs up and slaps you on the shoulder and says, tag, you're it. It's as if his entire existence was lived in the shadows. And to make it all worse, this man would have felt far from God. You see, it was common for Jewish people in this time period to view a disease like this almost as a scarlet letter. As if God had done this to them as a result of their sin or the sin of somebody else. This is why in John 9, 2, whenever the disciples see the man born blind, they ask Jesus. They say, is, is it because of him? Or is it because of his parents' sin? What, what is it? And Jesus is going to correct them. He says, it's neither. Right? It's actually so that God would get glory through healing. We know that because of the misinterpretation of Leviticus 21, 18, that those who were crippled were not even allowed to enter into the temple for worship. Okay, so Leviticus 21, 18 says that for those that were going to be Levitical priests, that they couldn't be crippled or blind or have any of these ailments. But, you know, over time, they began to build up more parameters around these rules and just said, you know what, that, we should just be a little on the safe side and those people shouldn't even be able to enter into the worship service. And so imagine this man as he sits so close within feet of the temple courts each and every day, only being able to hear the muffled sounds of people singing praise, people crying out to God, and the word going forth as it's read. There he sat outside the temple, passed by, overlooked. And yet this man, its physical condition as a picture of us all apart from Christ, sitting in our brokenness. Because you see, even if you can physically walk, you've been affected by the brokenness of sin. Apart from Christ, we aren't just crippled. As Paul says in Ephesians 2, we are dead in our sins. We are outside of the place of God's presence. We don't comprehend as we should the reality that we are made in God's image and derive our worth from him, that we were designed for his glorious purposes. No, we often just seek what we can get from the world without realizing that God actually has much more to offer. And perhaps that's where some of you are this morning. You don't have a relationship with the Lord. You're here this morning, and I'm not asking if you've ever prayed a prayer, if you've ever walked an aisle, if you've ever been baptized. I'm not asking if you've ever gone through any of the motions. I'm asking, have you ever had the point in which you cried out to God and said, I am a sinner in need of a Savior, and the only one who can save me is Jesus Christ? Have you come to the point in which you've realized your brokenness in that way? 
And could it be that there are feelings of isolation or loneliness that are causing you to realize that reality? Does your current situation seem optionless? Do you feel stuck? Maybe it's almost as if you're seeing all of life in grayscale, resentful, dis- distant, or just plain exhausted. Maybe that's where you are, sitting in your brokenness. For others of you, you are a Christian. And let me ask, is there some unforeseen circumstance? Or is there some besetting sin, some path of suffering or some current sin that has made even the Christian life feel crippling? You see, could it be that you just simply need to be honest with God and confess your own desire to be self-sufficient, that you need to confess to God the futility of your self-reliance in the midst of whatever difficult circumstance you're facing. There is no reward for pulling yourself up by your bootstraps. You are not omnipotent, but God is. Could it be that you need to acknowledge a sin that you've just kind of been downplaying? I've been saying this isn't really that big of a deal, right? And it's almost as if Though you have been raised to walk in new life, you've been limping in sin. Thomas Watson says, till sin be bitter, Christ will not be sweet. Could it be that Christ doesn't seem that sweet in your life right now because you're not viewing your sin as bitter as it actually is? Just kind of nursing it, not really crucifying it, just letting it get to the best of you here and now, running back to it again and again. Let me say this, if you're not impressed or in awe of God's grace toward you, it could be that you don't realize just how much God has saved you from your sin and that God is presently able to remove the presence of sin in your life. You see, we must be honest with God, not putting on a show, not putting on a mask. We must be honest with God and admit that we are still people in process because the only way forward begins with admitting where you are. Are you broken? And as one has been, that has been redeemed, where do you still see the brokenness of sin in your life? And ask this not only for you, but to ask who is around you that finds themselves in that place? Who is the lame person? Who's the crippled person that you walk by daily? Who is the one who has a physical or spiritual, spiritual need? Who is the one who doesn't know Christ around you? Is it a child? Is it a roommate? Is it a friend? Is it a coworker? Are you concerned about their spiritual state? Are you broken over their brokenness? I mean, let me say this. If you feel more compassion or desperation for the crippled man in this story than you do those who don't know Christ around you, then we need the gospel to inform our perspective of what it truly means to be broken. And that should drive us with compassion to those around Christ or those around us who don't know Christ. And the good news is that we can offer this hope to anyone and everyone because we have experienced it ourselves. We can offer this hope to others because this is where, if you are a Christian, you have once been. And the good news of the gospel is that our Lord meets us in our brokenness. Every other religion, every other religion says, fix yourself so you can come to God. Fix yourself so you can come to God. Christianity, unlike any other, says, God has put on flesh to come to you, to save you. Our Savior came for us in our broken state, did not just become lame for us, but laid down his life for us, that we would not remain in our broken state, but have life in his name. In the glorious truth of the gospel and the immeasurable grace that it offers to each and every one of you is that whenever you once again wander off and you find yourself asking for the alms of this world to satisfy yet again, Jesus goes to find you and to redeem you by his grace. Do you see how kind our Lord is? That your brokenness doesn't cause him to turn from you. That your brokenness is the prerequisite required to receive his grace. And the hope that we have in Jesus' name is the hope that this man was about to experience in this present moment. 
So yes, as he sat there, hundreds, maybe thousands of people passed by, but there are two men that are about to look him in the eyes and stop where he is, and his life will be changed forever, which leads us to the second posture we see in this passage, receiving the good news of hope and healing. The only way to move from our broken state in our sin and death to anywhere else is to receive this good news of hope and healing in Christ. Now, I I want you to, if you can, almost imagine this scene through this man's eyes. All right, so we see here in verse 2, he's been brought to the beautiful gate, and and as he's laying there, I I want you to, to feel the contrast. The beautiful gate is unlike any other gate. I think I have a picture of it behind me. This is just kind of an artist rendering, but there were 10 gates around the temple. Okay, nine of the gates were coated, overlaid with silver and gold. All right, so they were, they were beautiful, but this gate, the gate that he is beside is the Nicanor gate. It was unlike any other, no silver and gold on this gate, but a gate made of Corinthian bronze, the largest gate, 75 feet tall. Historians say that it would have taken nearly 20 men just to close this gate. Now imagine that you're sitting at the foot of it on those curved steps, right? This picture of beauty that was admired by others and then there you sit in the dust. And as you sit there, you see these two men walking. You actually recognize it's, it's these two men that you know have been with Jesus. You've been sitting at the temple gates for, for years, right? You, I mean, you would have seen them before. Actually, you remember they walked with Jesus and and you knew the story of Jesus. You, knew, you, actually, you actually knew that Jesus healed people that were in your same condition. Jesus was like no other, but for some reason it seemed like you were always in the wrong place at the wrong time. And so other people were getting healed. Here I am, still crippled. And, and then Jesus was crucified, and you thought, well, now there's definitely no way I'm going to get healed. But then Jesus rose again, and you, you saw this excitement reverberate throughout the city, and the disciples are, are proclaiming, his resurrection, and he's teaching about the kingdom of God, and he's on the earth for 40 days, but then he ascends back to heaven, and there you are, still crippled. You're wondering, well, I must have missed my chance of healing for good at this point. What hope do I have now? Well, I mean, here's these two Christians. They always walk with Jesus. I mean, at the very least, they're probably generous people. Right? I've actually heard that some of the Christians, that so many people came into Jerusalem for the pilgrimage, and people needed places to stay or, or, or or ways of survive. I mean, they're selling their possessions to be generous to give to one another. I mean, certainly these guys will at least give me some spare change at the very least. And so you see them, as verse 3 says, walking toward you, and you clear your throat, and as loud as you can, say, alms for the poor. And to your surprise, they stop. And you got to know nobody stops. Right? People don't stop. I mean, at the very least, people kind of, you know, will slow down and, and throw some change into your hands or into your cup or whatever you have, but, like, nobody stops. They don't want to look at, at the crippled man, right? I mean, you're just kind of a burden to other people, and yet Peter and John stop. And as all of this is going through your mind, you hear the words, look at us. Peter wants me to look at him. I don't know him. He doesn't know me. He says, look, look at us. And as you turn your gaze toward him, You make eye contact, and in that moment, you're thinking, this guy's probably about to give me the biggest donation I've ever received. I mean, he wants me to look at him. I mean, am I going to be able to take a couple days off? Am I going to be able to to no longer sit in this dry heat for a couple days, just kind of baking in the sun? I mean, is is he about to bless me in such a way that I want to do this for for even another two days? Just just a little break. And then when Peter says the words of no beggar wants to hear, right? I have no silver and gold. And you're thinking, right, come on, man. You know, like, I mean, at the very least, if you're not going to give me something, then at least move out of the way so that other people that want to actually give some sort of donation can, can give it to me. But Peter doesn't stop there. He keeps talking. And he says, silver and gold have I none. I don't have any silver or gold, but what I do have, I give to you. And you're you're puzzled. You're trying to figure it out. And then he reaches down his right hand and says, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And it's the most powerful name you've ever heard. And he says, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. 
And in that moment, you experience something you have never experienced before. Uh, There is a power that surges through your lower extremities that has never existed. Muscles that have never been used, shriveled from birth, begin to expand, filled with blood and full of strength. And as Peter reaches down his hand to contact your right hand, he pulls you up and you experience healing, hope, and wholeness for the very first time in your life. And this man has received a gift far greater than silver and gold. Now, why is it that this man's story is so worthy of our careful reflection? Because it is so analogous to the riches we have received in Christ. The account of this man's healing is worth our careful reflection. Imagine this. Imagine how the request for mere coins or spare change from the passers-by felt after realizing that complete healing was accessible to him. I mean, he just wanted to survive for one more day, did he not? I mean, he was just looking to, to find enough change to purchase his next meal. And yet what we see here is that what God was actually willing to give him was bodily healing and eternal life far greater than anything that he had ever sought in the world. He was seeking spare change when God could give him so much more. And let me ask, is that you? Are you seeking spare change when God has far more to offer? What are you seeking? Those of you in middle school and high school, are you, are you seeking to be the smartest kid in your class, the one who's the most popular or the one who's the starter on the football team? For those of you who are preparing for this election, what are you seeking? That your politician is the one in the White House, and you can give the exact reasons why. Maybe those of you who are in college and looking for a spouse, what do you say? I mean, you just want to get the attention of the cute girl in your accounting class. Maybe others of you, you you want to live in a neighborhood that's a little bit safer. You want to drive something different. You want to live somewhere else. You want to do something that matters, that people talk about even after you're gone. And what I want to say to you is that those things might be okay, but they far pale in comparison to the riches of Christ. Some of you, you're here and and you don't have a relationship with Jesus, and I'm glad you're here. It also makes me wonder why you're here. Right? You're here and and maybe you've come because you just want to find some friends. And you can find friends here. Maybe you're here because you've got some spiritual questions that you're wrestling with. And I want you to know this is the safest place, the best place to wrestle with those questions. Others of you, you came here and you're looking for guidance for some decision that you're making. Maybe you want to make yourself feel better for, for some past regret that you have. And so church feels like the right place to do that. Maybe you're here and, and you're just like, you know what? I want to send my kids to the classes here because I want my children to grow up with a good moral framework. And Christianity kind of seems like as good as any. But what I want you to say that although those things might be good, those are spare change compared to the riches of knowing Jesus Christ personally. Don't beg for the alms of this world when God gives you so much more in eternal life with Christ. Christian, do you have a relationship with Jesus but still find yourself calling out that familiar phrase, alms for the poor, holding out your hands to the world? as if it actually has something that can satisfy? Do not beg outside the temple when you've been given everything you need in Christ. Too often we hold out our hands to the world, don't we? Seeking to be satisfied, we call out to others, we call out to the people around us. Make me feel valuable. Give me some sense of self-worth. Alms for the poor. We call out to our career. Give me a sense of purpose. Make me feel like I matter. We call out to our bank account, looking at that balance. Give me some sense of security. We call out to our plans. Make me feel like I'm in control, like I can somehow determine my own future. You are seeking from the world what it was never designed to give, and everything you long for can be found in Christ. Do you long for security? He gives you eternal life, and no one can snatch you out of his hand. 
Do you long for peace? He is the Prince of Peace. He is peace embodied, and he wants to know you personally. Christian, he does. He just says, ask for it. Are you here this morning, and, and you are longing for control whenever in reality you need to open your hands to the one who is in control of it all? Don't settle for the silver and gold of this world when all that you need, everything that you need, is found in Christ. And in fact, to think that the fleeting pleasures of this world will somehow satisfy the deepest longings of our soul is to misunderstand how desperate we truly are apart from Christ. I mean, think about that. Do you think that this man ever said the words, if I could just walk? Of course he did. Do you think he ever just, you know, he's getting carried, he's getting laid in the dirt, same spot, can't go anywhere. Do you think he ever just said, man, I, my life would be so much better. I would be completely fulfilled if I could just walk. If I could just walk, I mean, no, no, no more problems. Let me ask you this. If you can walk, how's that going for you? You still have problems? Even if you can walk, your feet ever get tired, right? Do you think he ever said, if I could just walk, and then somebody was like, Dude, there is this thing called stubbing your toe, and it is the most excruciating pain you will ever feel in your life. Walking is not, you know. I mean, this, this man experiences healing from the Lord, right? But it goes even further than healing in that the deepest longings of his soul are satisfied whenever he receives eternal life through the name of Jesus Christ. We know that because he is going to enter the temple and he is going to praise the God that healed him. And here we see that all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. All who call upon the name of the Lord will experience this kind of restoration. And why is it so important for us to continue to remind ourselves of this gospel? Why is it so important for us as a church to constantly rehearse this good news? Because I know some of you are sitting there and you're thinking, I already know this, right? We talk about this every week. We just use a different passage of scripture to get there. It's like, yeah, I have nothing better to say than Christ crucified for you, risen from the dead, and gives us eternal life so we have a relationship with God. That's, that's, that's our message, but why is it so important for me to remind you of that today? Because you can't give to others what you don't have. Because what does Peter say? Silver and gold, I don't have. Um, but what I do have, I give to you. You see, Peter could offer this man hope in Jesus because he had received it himself. Peter could relate to this man, not because Peter was formerly lame, but because Peter was a liar. Because Peter was a sinner. Because Peter had experienced the unexpected and immeasurable forgiveness of Christ as he stood before him and received his embrace after he had betrayed him. You see, Peter was giving what he had, and what he had was Jesus Christ. And here's why that's so important for you, church, because you will not pass on to others what you don't possess yourself. Right? So, so if you're thinking like, man, I, you know, maybe I should go, maybe I could serve, and it's like that all feels exhausting to you. Do you, man, do you really, do you really possess this truth in a way that has reoriented your entire life? Because you won't pass on what you don't possess, and you won't pass on what you don't prioritize. Right? So, so if your faith is just, you know, number seven on the list of a lot of things that you've got going on, man, you're not going to pass that on to others. You won't pass on what you don't prioritize, but whenever Christ becomes central in your life, you'll say, you know what? Silver, gold, whatever else, I, I don't have. I don't have all the answers, right? But here's what I do have. I have the hope of Jesus, and I will give that to you. And here we see that this man experiences healing. He's healed outside the temple. One, this shows us that the work of God does not get confined by anything because the message of God is going forth. Healing happens outside the temple. Not only that, isn't it interesting? I mean, I, I just love the Bible. You see stuff like this you've never seen before, and you're like, this is amazing. But he's healed outside of the only gate that didn't have what? Silver or gold. And yet it's called the beautiful gate. And could it be that as we think through this passage, we see this beautiful gate behind this man, and yet Peter and John show him an even more beautiful gate, the gate that leads to knowing God, and he enters in and has life eternal 
which leads us to the third posture. We are raised to walk in relationship with Christ. This man is raised to walk in relationship with Christ. Peter does not seek to get the credit from this miracle as it takes place. No, it was, it was his words, but it was Christ's work. It is the powerful name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth in which this man walks up. And I think Peter's intentional in pointing to Jesus as the Christ, the Messiah, the omnipotent Son of God, who can do anything with all authority, but also Jesus of Nazareth, the God who took on flesh to experience our plight, who was a human, who knows how hard this world is, which means for each and every person, Jesus simultaneously suffers alongside you and has the authority to provide any comfort or peace you need. Only Jesus can do that. And so this man is healed in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And in that moment, this man's body is a physical enactment of what it is like to be united to a resurrected Savior. I mean, the words here, right? Rise up. And then what happens? Verse 7, Peter takes him by the right hand and raised him up. Now, the interesting thing is that, that that phrase, raised him up, is used seven times throughout the book of Acts. But in every other instance, do you know what it refers to? The resurrection of Jesus. Why? Because right now, whenever this man experiences the power of Christ in his life to heal and restore, he is experiencing the resurrection power of Christ because in this moment, he is united to our resurrected Lord. He was raised up from the dirt because Jesus was raised up from the dead. And whenever you are united to Christ, you walk in a newness of life with a life that only Christ could provide in you. This is amazing, right? I mean, uh, yesterday, I officiated a wedding right here on this stage. And during that wedding ceremony, after the vows are said, I say the two have become one. They're united to one another. Well, Scripture tells us that whenever you place your faith in Christ, you're united to Him which means you are hidden in him, which means his righteousness now covers all of your sins and all of your failures. And it also means that now Christ is in you, the hope of glory, which means Christ's resurrection power resides within your soul. Changes everything. It actually not only saves you, but sanctifies you daily. Changes your desires and affections that you would delight to obey. Gives you the ability to walk as one who is following Jesus. We have experienced this good news and have been raised to life. This is miraculous. right? For those of us who might look at this passage and say, well, why don't we see miracles like this all the time? We do. We see a miracle like this every time someone goes from being dead in their sin to having life in Christ. Not only that, we do see physical miracles. There's not a single Christian that doesn't believe that God can do anything he wants at any time he wants. And God still heals. God still saves. We'll talk about this a little bit more next week as we just talk about the way that God works in the world. But I also want you to see, man, this one man's healing is going to lead to 2,000 more people placing their faith in Christ. Right? That's totally worth it. God is doing something grander here than this man can even understand. And the hope that we have in the gospel as we look at this account of physical healing is that regardless of if God heals someone right now on earth or heals someone completely one day in his presence, every single person that has trusted in Christ will one day be completely healed and glorified. That's the hope we have for our loved ones. That's the hope that we have for our aching bodies, that Christ restores. And that's exactly what this man experiences in the present. It, I mean, I love that Luke is a doctor, okay? And so as we read verse 7, and, you know, he's, he says, this man immediately stood up. He's not talking about, like, a gradual process or, you know, like, this guy kind of, like, needing to work. He's, no, this guy stood up like he had never done otherwise. And Luke, the doctor, knew that. It's miraculous. The Lord did this miracle, and it led to this man's praise. Fourth and final posture, we praise God and seek his presence. In verse 8, we find a complete reversal of this man's life. I mean, that's why I said so much can happen in 10 verses, right? I mean, from the dirt to now 
He's healed. He's made whole. He was unable to stand. Now what do we find him doing? He's leaping. He's jumping. Leaping. A, a word that we'll go back to in a moment. He was once outside of the temple, forbidden to enter now. And he's able to enter the place of worship and worship among God's people in the presence of God. He was once sitting alone. I love in verse 8, and this is a small thing, but one of the things that you just kind of see when you stare at a passage for an entire week, he keeps entering the temple with them, right? Peter and John weren't like, oh, that was cool. All right, see you later, you know? They're like, hey, you're one of us now. Come with us, right? And I mean, as a church, we're, we're not the church that's just like, make a decision to follow Jesus, see you later. No, it's making disciples, not just leading people to make decisions. And so we say, hey, you want to follow Jesus? Guess what? This is the perfect place to do that. Come walk with us. And this man, he gets up. He's walking with Peter and John. He goes into the temple. He was once asking for money. Now what? He's found riches in Christ. We see that this man is described as leaping and um, it's interesting, if you, if you read through the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the Septuagint, you will find that the word that is used here for leaping actually goes back to the passage from Isaiah 35 that we read earlier. And there was this prophecy given, and it was basically things are about to get really hard for Israel because you have sinned against God, but let me give you a ray of hope that there will come one one day, and there are going to be a couple signs that surround this, all right? The blind will see, the mute will talk, the lame will leap like a deer. And whenever you see those things, you will know salvation's come to God's people. That there's this new era that has been ushered in, an era of restoration that might begin small, like mustard seed-like small, but it's actually going to reverberate throughout the entire world. And one day, that Messiah will come and he will make all things new. But you're going to begin to see the seeds of that whenever you start to see lame men walking. And what happens here? Man, a crippled guy gets up and walk. And if you are any Jew who's familiar with the scriptures, immediately Isaiah 35, 4 through 6 comes to mind. Say to those who have an anxious heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come. What about all these people that are oppressing us? Your God will come with vengeance, with the recompense of God. He will come and he will save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, the ears of the deaf unstopped, and then, the, then shall the lame man leap like a deer. And the tongue of the mute sing for joy, for waters break forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. Behold, your Messiah has come. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And this moment confirms that Christ is who he said he was that he is the one who gives life to all who believe. This man receives physical healing. He's able to walk into the temple now and worship. This man is a part of a new community, and he praises God. It wasn't obligated. It wasn't forced. It was the overflow of for the first time because of his life in Christ, now feeling completely whole and healed. And as you would imagine, as they entered the temple, verse 10 says this, people, people recognized him. All right, wait, that's the guy. I mean, for a decade, he sat outside the temple. Is that, that can't be him, right? No, he's, he's jumping, he's, he's leaping, he's, he's praising God. How could this be? They're filled with wonder and amazement, and we will see Peter answer that question in the second sermon in the book of Acts. But what we see as we reflect finally on this man's life is that he is living proof to each and every person in this room that wherever you are right now is not where you always have to be. That's true of people around you too. Wherever you are right now is not where you always have to be. Has anybody ever told you that? Because with Jesus, that's possible. Right? Because Jesus came and lived the perfect life that you and I should have lived but never could have. Because Jesus on the cross took every single sin that you and I have sinned, placed it upon his shoulders, and absorbed the wrath of God in our place. Because Jesus went to war with sin, Satan, and death, but could not stay dead because he is the author of life, and he rose from the grave. And if you place your faith in this risen Jesus, you will be risen to walk with him. 
you will be given new life. You see, this man is raised from the dust because Christ was raised from the dead. And that is the life-giving reality for each and every one of us in this room. Because Christ was raised, you have been risen to walk with him. You see, whenever we've truly encountered Christ, we are raised to walk with him. We're raised to follow him. Let me ask, if you were to take account of your spiritual state right now, would you say that you are you're raised to walk with Jesus? Would would you say that you're walking with Jesus? Would you say you're just kind of standing still? Would you say that you're just taking a step here or there? Or would you say you're truly pursuing Christ? You see, I think it's often the case that the, the difficulty of our life, our preoccupation with the things of this world, our own awareness of our shortcomings can often breed a, a sense of disenchantment, despondency in, in our walk with the Lord that leads to just complacency. There was a moment in, in the prophet Jeremiah's life in which uh, there were so many things coming at him and life was so difficult that he just began to feel like he was exhausted, like, like he couldn't go on. And in that moment... The Lord came to him and asked him the question, if you have raced with men on foot, if if you've lived this life in this way and they have wearied you, then how will you compete with horses? If you've raced among men and and you've just gone tired, complacent, exhausted, how will you run with the horses to follow God's call in your life? If a safe land, you're distrusting And what will you do in the thicket of the Jordan? What will you do as things get more difficult? In essence, God is saying, Jeremiah, I have redeemed you. I have raised you up that you may run with the horses. You have been raised to run after God. So don't let the difficulty of this world stop you in your tracks. Don't let your pursuit of whatever might seem easy or convenient prevent you from experiencing all that God has to offer in his presence, would it be that you would realize you have been raised to take bold risks of faith, that you are to truly live as if to live is Christ and to die is gain, that you would go with God to the ends of the earth, that you would prioritize your faith in such a radical way that it even might invite ridicule from the world around you, that you would realize that you have been raised to walk with God and to run with the horses for his glory. You see, we were once broken, but we have received good news. And that good news has raised us to life. And as those who have been raised to life, we now praise God and we run for his glory. Let's pray.